sorry the microphone is off today. I can't hear the little bit, so if I'm going to talk to Ryan or somebody, just tell me. But then we have, we'll try to talk to Ryan about it today because um, we had an executive session prior to this meeting. And uh, personality legal issues. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It's <laughs> been a long time since I've done it. Yeah. And uh, do we have a roll call, please? Mrs. Kozar? Here. Mr. Laser? Here. I think. Mr. Lacasio? Here. Mrs. Mays? Mr. Music? Here. Mr. Obarto? Here. Mr. Palmer? Here. Dr. Zorch? Mr. House? Thank you. Uh, solicitor report, Mr. April. Uh, next week on your agenda, there is going to be a approval of the Lincoln Avenue Parking Agreement from the Joint Foundation. What this is, is it's a very small strip of land uh, directly across from the, the uh, administration building, but uh, between Lincoln Avenue and the uh, walking trail by the new LES. And uh, the foundation is simply giving a licensing agreement for a dollar to the school district to allow the school district to use that area for the parking, for the building. The school district will have a responsibility for the paving and the cabin and keeping it uh, clean and clear of snow. And the school, the school district will agree because the property is being allowed for uh, use just by a dollar that we will take responsibility for the parking. Um, that's all, I'm Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Legislative report, Mr. Schwartz. Just a, an update, and that is that supposedly the budget is still on track to be approved by June 30th. We'll see. Um, but secondly, um, the House and the Senate both passed a House Bill 564, which is about a mandatory civics test. Um, the governor has until June 21st to sign it into action. And basically, the bill requires school entities to administer at least once to students in grades 7 through 12 a locally developed assessment on U.S. history, government, and civics. You are permitted to use the U.S. Citizenship <coughs> and Immigration Services test, which you might have read about in the past few months. It is not a requirement of passing it for graduation. However, by the 2021 school year, the state would collect data on how many students were proficient or passed the test. Um, and we would be required as the LEA to provide that information. Again, it is not law at this point. The governor has until June 21st to decide what he's doing with it. But it did pass the Senate and the House. So more to come on that. Thank you very much. <coughs> Education and planning. Uh, Mr. Lucasio, would you take that over in the absence of Mrs. Maines, please? Uh, I believe we have a presentation today, Dr. Yes. Tepper. Yes, you? we do. We have our elementary principals, Mrs. Holler, Mrs. Pellis, and Mrs. Stewart, who are going to present on Math Solutions, a professional development initiative that has been ongoing in our elementary schools this school. within the county. 
we compared them to schools with across the state. Um, we had already begun conversation about our math instruction, but that evening we did share with you our concerns regarding our math scores and our math instruction. Don't get me wrong, our scores were good, but we wanted better than that for our students. Um, we began to look at what we did instructionally, what we were currently doing, and we started making plans for where we wanted to be, what we wanted to do. At one time, we were very traditional in math instructors. Um, we taught algorithms, basic computation. We found, though, that that was not beneficial to our students moving forward in their math careers at the secondary level. When I say traditional or computation, this is the type of math problem that I'm referring to. Go ahead and take a second. Try to solve that problem. You can write down. You can do it mentally. No cheating on the feet. Take a second. Look at that. With God raising hands, how many of you got the answer of three eighths? You don't have to show up hands. But if you didn't get that answer, did you want to give up? Or did you want to figure out why it wasn't correct? Did you have that mindset of, what did I miss? What did I do wrong? I know how to do that. Did you feel challenged at all by that problem? Did you struggle at all if you were solving that problem? Did you have the opportunity to talk to your elbow partners about how to solve that problem? What math vocabulary did you hear or did you use when discussing solving that problem, what manipulatives could you have used to solve that problem? Here's a good one. If I were to ask you how you got your answer, what would you tell me? Could you tell me why you chose the steps that you chose? You probably don't have an answer for all those questions, and that's okay. And most of you probably looked at that problem and said, one half multiplied by three fourths. Did anyone read that problem as half of three fourths? Look at this, Steve. <laughs> so many students um, who were taught the algorithms and never had the opportunity to discuss the problems and share ideas, they believe that math is hard. Um, or when they can't remember the steps of long division, does McDonald's sell cheeseburgers? They think, oh, I just can't do it. I'm not a math student. I, I just, I'm not even, I'm done trying. But we want to change that thought process. We want the students to be challenged, but we want them to be motivated by that challenge and success of solving that hard problem. We moved forward with purchasing Go Math, and we did get some of what we were looking for, um, obviously, in Go Math. We, Felt, we feel though now that we still need more. We got, we need that problem solving, that inquiry based instruction. We need that opportunity to struggle and grow. And we talk a lot about growth mindset in math. That's the core of what we do. Students' willingness to make mistakes and to share that thinking out loud. It's okay that my answer was wrong. This is what I did. So how can you help me, as a, t as a class or a teacher, get the right answer to this problem? It's also a shift in thinking for teachers. We have to move from the I do, we do, you do model to the you do, we do, I do model. And the I do is making sure that I, as the instructor, and making sure that you understand the math within that lesson. We want students to feel comfortable being challenged. And there's a lot of value in challenging our students. Sometimes math is hard. And sometimes we have to struggle, even in life, to figure things out. When we introduce that more complex problem, we give them the opportunity, and yes, I say opportunity, to struggle. When we offer problems that are more complex, they're more interesting, they're engaging. And they struggle. But it's constructive struggling. It's not pointless frustration where we don't help them. Students learn perseverance. They learn critical thinking. They learn motivation to keep going to get that correct answer. High quality teaching is the single most important factor 
for raising student achievement. That is what it, that's what our job is. And that is why we brought in Mass Solutions, because it is our job to help the teachers find that right level of complexity, one that's both constructive and instructive. Research shows that 21st century businesses note that the ability to tackle a problem that is not easily solved is one of the most important traits they look for in an employee. And this is where we are instructionally. We have enlisted the help of math solutions to reach our most current math instruction goals, and that is the problem solving in the elementary levels. And Sherry's going to talk a little bit about math solutions. So we realized, based on everything that Mrs. Stewart said, that we needed some assistance in getting to where we wanted to go. So we researched and found this company called Math Solutions. It's actually a subsidiary of Harcourt, so it really um, worked out well that we have the Go Math, which is Harcourt, so they know that program at the back of their hand. Some things that we found fascinating was Math Solutions was founded by Marilyn Burns. That may mean absolutely nothing to you, but as educators, it means a lot to us. She is at the guru of math. Um, she has been in this, um, developing courses, doing professional development. She does conferences. She's written in journals. She really is looked upon highly in the field of mathematics education. So we found that very intriguing for Math Solutions. We also like what they did. Um, and you can see up there, they talk about the teachers. It's really about educating the teachers. As Mrs. Stewart said, they are the most valuable factor in getting kids to learn math and being able to do it. So it helps teachers become more confident and knowledgeable. And the end result is students then will become more engaged and excited about learning math. Yes, students will be excited about learning math. <laughs> so, the guiding principles behind Math Solutions um, is that they want educators to know that the math that they know the math they teach, they need to know it well, so that they can be flexible enough to understand that there are various solution paths to increase students' reasoning of math. That the one size fits all just doesn't work. Um, the second thing is they have to know conditions necessary for learning. They have to um, be able to provide what the students need so that students can make sense for themselves what the problem is asking them to do. Educators also need to know students' strengths and weaknesses in addition to content knowledge. They have to have a lot of strategies up their sleeve to be able to get the reasoning and to actually work with a lot of misconceptions. Uh, when we work with math solutions, they're all about misconceptions. What may go wrong? What isn't the right answer and why? And how you figure it out. And then lastly, um, that educators again have the expertise to make math accessible for all students. We have a very diverse group of learners. We have some that math may come very easily, some who struggle, but it's our job as educators to make sure that through our questioning that we are making it relevant and accessible to all. So, Math Solutions offered us a couple different paths to take. We decided the first part was professional learning. We really wanted them to come in and provide some in-service professional development for our K-6 math teachers. The second part was job embedded modeling. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. This is Alice. So I'm going to be talking about what Mass Solutions look like, what it looked like here at Greater Latrobe. So we realized Mass Solutions is what we wanted, and then we started to work with them to say, okay, what's that going to look like in the 2017 2018 school year here at Greater Latrobe? So as she said, we talked about professional learning, but then also the job embedded modeling. Professional learning, I would say to you, that's very traditional professional development. It's teachers in a classroom with a presenter from Math Solutions talking about best practices and sharing those ideas together. And then the job embedded learning or modeling was a little bit more 
more non-traditional. We were actually working with our own students. It happened on school days. We had substitutes in the classroom and our teachers all together working with math solutions. So we will look at both of those now. So the professional learning, or the very traditional professional development for our students, happened in August and then in January. In August, all K-6 students received, the K-6 teachers received making sense of math, a focus on reasoning and discourse. So mathematical classroom discourse is about the whole class discussion. It's when the students are talking about mathematics in a way that they reveal their understanding of these concepts. During this, it can be used to determine what students are thinking and understanding in order to better build those bridges between what they know and what they still need to learn. It can also offer opportunities to develop agreed upon mathematical meanings or definitions for those mathematical terms. So all K-6 teachers needed to have that foundation from Math Solutions. So that would happen in August. And then in January, they came back. And in January, we split the K-2 teachers from the 3-6 teachers. Because at that time, they had already started using some of this professional learning in their classrooms. And we realized what K-2 needed was very different than what 3-6 needed. So the kindergarten through second grade teachers, they received professional development in this very traditional manner on developing number sense. And number sense, it refers to the student's sense of what a number means. It, they understand the relationships between each number. And they're able to perform mental math and understand the symbolic representations. I often use the example about the number sense, and this would be with a kindergarten student. If you ask a kindergarten student, what is the number seven? A student that doesn't have number sense, they will show you the numeral seven. They will draw or write seven. That's what seven is. A student with number sense, if you said, what is number seven? They would say seven is five and two, seven is three and four, Seven is more than six. Seven is less than ten. That student has true number sense. They understand the meaning of that number. So that's what K2, the kindergarten through second grade teachers, they had professional development on developing that number sense for all students. And then the six through, or three through six teachers, they developed the math through problem solving. And problem solving requires figuring out what to do and how to do it without giving the students step-by-step -step instructions. So we want them to truly solve that problem on their own. We're not going to say step one, you do this, step two, you do this, step three, you do this. We want them to truly solve that problem on their own. So both of these in August and January, traditional professional development, but learning opportunities for our teachers for their mathematic instructions. Here are two different graphics of information that the teachers had during um, this time, this one, it's hard to read up there, but it's facilitating meaningful mathematical discourse. So this just gave the teachers an opportunity to say, this is what this should sound like in our classroom, to get that mathematical talk happening. And this graphic shows some questioning that can be happening within the mathematics classroom. One up here says, do you agree with Julie's reasoning? So it's not just about the answer to that mathematics problem, it's about the reasoning of why they did what they did to get to that answer. Or another one, does anyone have a different approach? If you're working on problem solving, there isn't always just one way to get to that correct answer. There might be multiple ways. So do you agree with how they got there, or do you have a different way to get to that same answer? Then we also had the non-traditional um, services from math solutions, and this is called the job embedded modeling. So in December, we had 30 or 63 kindergarten through sixth grade teachers um, meet with math solutions, and they sent us a coach, and she came to LES, and we had a classroom that was just with the teachers, and they met by grade level. So all kindergarten teachers went at the same time. We had a lesson pre-brief, and I'll explain what all of this means, then the actual lesson, and then a lesson debrief. So kindergarten had an opportunity to do this, first grade teachers had an opportunity to do this, and we did it by grade level, so that they could go into the classrooms and see this actually happen. So what is the lesson pre-brief? So what that is, was they would come in, and they would be working together as a grade level team. So if it was second grade, the coach that came from Mass Solutions said, what are some misunderstandings? What's happening in your classrooms right now? And because we're all following the math, we're all basically at the same spot. So she would say, okay, what are you working on right now? Where are the trouble spots? So they would talk about that with her. 
And from there, then she would say, let's find a good problem-solving problem to work with the students. And so they would come as the second grade teachers, they would come to an agreement on a problem that she was going to do with the second graders. So they would pull all of that together, um, and they would come to consensus, this is what we are going to see. Then they would go in and do this actual lesson with our Greater Latrobe School District students. So at this time, she goes into the second grade classroom, this coach, you're going to see a picture of it here in a minute, she goes in and she's now teaching the second grade students. And our Greater Latrobe School District teachers are sitting in the back observing it. So at this time, there's a visiting teacher from Mass Solutions teaching the concept. Our teachers are sitting in the back taking notes and they're observing the students. What are they doing? What are they saying? And they're observing this coach. What is she doing? What is she saying? What are her expectations? Oh, they gave a wrong answer. She's not just about, nope, that's not right. It's about, why are you thinking that's right? How did you get to that answer? Does anybody have something that can help this child? Or so on and so forth. So we were actually able to see her doing this. Following that lesson, we would go back then for the classroom debrief. And we would go back into the classroom and she would say, how do you think it went? And then we would discuss things, what was surprising to you? And then she would just take questions just from the teachers about, were you surprised by this? Or was this something that you would do different? So on and so forth with this coach so that we could see what it truly looked like within the classroom. So here you can see a picture on the left side. It's hard, you can't see it right there. But um, you can actually see those are our um, students there with the coach that's teaching the classroom. And then on the right hand side, you can see those are the teachers in the back. And we were given very strict orders. You know, you sit in the back, you don't talk, you're just taking notes. And then whenever the students would start to work in their little groups, you could walk around and see um, what they were working on so that you had a better understanding. So from there then, another part of the job embedded was she, the actual coach that came for the multiple days in January to work with our own students. She came back. And so in May, we gave the, the teachers time to start to create lessons similar to what she did on that day that they got to see her teach. And so at this point, we used this template that you can see over here on the side, which is what we were given from Mass Solutions that she had used. They used this template, and they started to create their lessons for next year. We created a Google folder for each grade level so that they're sharing those lessons across all three buildings. So that we're combining and conquering it together. When you're finding a great lesson, you share it with all the other buildings. And they, they also had time as they're working on this. The coach then went from grade level to grade level to talk with the teachers. What are you finding that's working? What are your questions that you have? Let's look at the lessons that you're creating and see if we can make them better. Or they we have it. Okay, what's the next step? And so she was able to go through um, and work with our teachers then at this time. So at this point, we have our Google folders ready, and we believe that we're ready to start for the 2018-19 school year with problem solving and inquiry-based lessons. We have a good start on it. So that is sort of where we are at this point um, with Mass Solutions. And so we had the very traditional professional development for our teachers, but then the non-traditional, which was the job embedded, um, to get them ready for this type of mathematic instruction. And you're up. Your test is back. That's right. I'm back. There's more math problems. <laughs> this is an example of one of the lessons that was created by our teachers. This goes back to that computation problem that I presented to you originally, which everyone probably looked at is one half multiplied by three fourths. But now let's take a look at it in a different format. My grandmother's making reusable grocery bags and lunch bags. She needs three-fourths of a yard of cloth to make a grocery bag. To make a lunch bag, she needs half of the amount of cloth needed to make a grocery bag, which we all see is that three-fourths. How much cloth does she need to make a lunch bag? Okay. Presenting the math this way makes it more relevant to the students because now hopefully they're getting some type of visual in their head of how I can solve this problem. It's now relevant. It truly becomes now a problem to solve. We have a problem. How much cloth do I need to make this lunch bag? Students work in groups. They talk about the problem and how they can solve it. They test their methods. They adjust their strategies if their answer isn't correct. 
They play with the math. They become less afraid of the math and more excited. Okay, so one way to solve the problem, and there are numerous ways to solve this. But one way is focusing on the one yard of cloth. So maybe the teacher gives the students a piece of paper. Okay, so picture that or tell you a piece of paper. They know that to create the grocery bag, they need three-fourths of a yard. No, you're not about fractions. They know they need to take the whole yard and divide it into four equal parts so that they can then represent three-fourths of that yard of cloth. Okay? So we know now that the blue shaded area represents the grocery bag. But that's not what the question asked us. The question asked us how much of the yard of material is needed to make the lunch bag. And the lunch bag is half of the material to make the grocery bag. So we would hope that our students would move forward in dividing them <coughs> all of the equal pieces in half because they know with fractions you need to have equal parts no. <laughs> equal parts. So you take half of all the equal parts, half of the amount, the focus, I keep calling it the focus material because that's the blue area. What is half of that blue area? Three equal parts. Out of how many equal parts now? We have eight. So the answer is three eighths. So half of Three-fourths is three-eighths. Did Dan got it right? Did Dan get it right? <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, <laughs> the conversation comes in because some students may not do it this way. Some students may make a circle, for whatever reason, divide it into fours, and divide each of those fours into halves, and shade it that way. There are many ways to do this. And this lesson was actually done by a group of teachers at LES, right, by teacher at LES. Um, and Mrs. Haller actually got to observe this lesson, and she said you would be amazed at the different ways the students actually solve this problem. So this is just one way for it to be solved, but again, the point is to have that conversation, some kids to have that struggle, to not give up, and really make that attempt to figure out how three days is the answer. So we'll be going back to shape. Right. So then our next steps as we go forward. Um, as you know, we, we're really embracing this inquiry-based learning. So it's really to continue to create these inquiry-based lessons, to implement them with our students. Um, we have the Go Math, but we want to supplement our Go Math program with real-world problem solving. You don't do lessons, uh, a ton of these lessons in a math period. Uh, you may do one of these a week that you just saw with Mrs. Stewart. Um, you may do two a week, but it's really to solidify the thinking process. And we, so yes. That, so does that mean you're still going to be showing them the algorithm? Absolutely. But sometimes <laughs> you'll say like one half times three fourths, and, and people don't have kids don't have any idea why is one half of three fourths, three eggs. So it's really about that visualization. But absolutely, you do get down to the algorithms with everything. And then we have to remember to continue to support our teachers. So we will continue with our professional learning for our educators. Um, we would like to thank the Great Lakeshore Partners in Education Foundation. They made math solutions possible for us. And we are so grateful for the wonderful opportunity that they gave to all of our educators and our students this year. So thank you. Two big picture items. First of all, I want to commend the elementary principals. They did an excellent job taking this and running with it. It was their idea. But for the past few years with the elementary teachers, they've also taken uh, an idea or a concept and done an entire year of professional development on it. I think as they articulated in the PowerPoint, it started at that first in-service day, and every in-service day was focused on math solutions. I think the elementary teachers like that they're doing one concept throughout the year. It's a full year of learning on topic. The second big picture item is when you're talking about building relationships with kids, 
knowing kids' strengths, knowing their weaknesses, that was part of the overarching goal that we had as a school district uh, going into this year for professional development, and that's knowing your kids and building relationships with them. So indirectly fulfilling two needs at the same time. But again, I commend uh, the three elementary principals for doing what feedback has said is the most significant math professional development that they've had in years. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sure somewhere along the line you guys have had a good math teacher. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Next, we'll have a enrollment report, Mr. Brenkin. The enrollment report is attached to your review. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, kindergarten enrollment at this point is 250 for the coming year, which is up slightly from last year. And we're still chasing about 15 parents. Uh, so if we could get that number closer to 260, I would think. Some parents will just decide to not send their children and start the enrollment process and decide against it, which is their, their right to do. So it could come up a little. But I think we're pretty lucky in the 250-260. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next week, we're going to be asked to approve the LESCO Federal Credit Union High School Branch License Agreement. And Mr. Baines, if you don't mind, just a real brief review of what that is. Sure. Sticking with the math theme this evening, but we're going to jump to consumer math. Uh, last December, there was an email that came across to the PSDA daily updates to talk about high school in Ben Salem, PA, that just started a student-run branch bank in their high school. I forwarded that email to Michelle Butler, who is our business teacher leader, and she was in my office a couple periods later wanting to know how we can make this happen. Uh, so we did a conference call with the Ben Salem principal. He told us exactly what they did uh, and all the benefits that they were seeing with, with their student-run branch. So our mentorship coordinator, Anthony Princeton, he's a recent grad, 2013 grad of Norwin. He knew Norwin had a student-run branch in their building, so he reached out to Norwin. Uh, at the same time, Linda Stein of the West Woman Credit Union reached out to Mr. Prevka uh, to say that they're running a branch in uh, Penn Trafford. So we set up an, an appointment to go see the student run branch in Penn Trafford in February, um, then came back and held some different discussions. And that's when Lesco um, jumped on board. And I learned throughout this whole process the credit unions are one big family. So when the West Morgan Credit Union reached out to us, they were also in touch with, with Lesco, wanting to know if they wanted to jump on board with us. We're extremely pleased to be working with Lesco because they're, they're located right in the heart of Lake Trobe. They're in our community, and I think they have a lot to offer us and our students. Um, the branch we're looking at opening, it, it's going to be run two days a week, run by our students. Uh, there will be a Lesco employee on site at all times that branch is open. We're looking at, uh, we're starting a lunch and learn concept next year, so the branch will be opening probably from about 10.30 to noon. Uh, on either Wednesdays or Fridays or Mondays and, and Wednesdays, we're still working out the logistics there. But two days a week, always a, always a Lesco employee on, on site. Uh, it would be more of an internship opportunity for our students, and it ties right along with our career pathway initiative. Uh, we started a personal finance class last year. We're going to tie it right into that personal finance class uh, so for some hands-on learning with consumer math. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Maines, no problem. And you too must have had a good enough teacher somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the next, uh, we have a series of agreements that we're going to be asked to approve. We have the Adult Eye Education Services, partial ESY, uh, extended school year summer program. We have to approve the West Fulham Intermediate Unit uh, Access Billing Services, approve Area Incorporated Contract for Professional mm -hmm. Services for the next school year, Approve Clean Heights Service Agreement for the next school year. Approve Pace Schools 2018 <coughs> Extended School Year Program. Approve the Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf Summer Extended Year Program. Uh, we also have to approve the Meraki, is that? Meraki, Pennsylvania, FDA, NHS, Pennsylvania Agreement for the next school year and extended year. Extended school year 2019 to 2019. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> uh, they changed their name. The NHS is now called Merafe or Meraki. I'm not sure which. They, I don't know if they were bought out, but no. Okay. They were bought out. 
We're going to be asked to approve the Mount Aloysius College Cooperative Agreement for next school year. We'll be asked to approve the tuition rates. Um, Dan, is there anything you want to say regarding this? Just that those tuition rates are published each May by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, driven by our audited or our annual financial report, um, as well as our ADMs. I can tell you that the, those rates uh, reflected an increase. Uh, the elementary tuition rate went up by $500.74, and the secondary tuition rate went up by $468.32. Thank you. And we'll be asked to approve a tuition student for next year, Scott McBroom, from the Lear Valley School District. And the next curriculum committee meeting will be Tuesday, June 19th at 5.30 in the CSC. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just wanted to thank the <coughs> girls who made the presentation. I should say our principals. <laughs> <laughs> but what a job you guys did here. I, when I went to school, I hated math. And I'm sitting over there, I'm thinking, boy, that enthusiasm that you bring down to the teachers and into the kids. Tremendous job. <coughs> so much. I appreciate it. And I the board of us, too. Mr. Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, next week, we'll be asking you to approve the treasurer's report. Uh, there's an attachment. Um, payment of bills. Approve the 2018-2019 uh, insurance renewals. Uh, and Richard Cassidy is here this evening to catch us up. Thank you, um, Richard Caskey with Catan Freddie Insurance. Um, in front of you, you guys have the letter uh, that Dan uh, provided. It's just a uh, brief summary, so again, high level, I'm not going into um, details. Uh, but if there's any questions, we can do that. Um, first of all, from a property liability standpoint, um, the increase is about 1.8%. Part of that is the building values get appraised every year. The building values went up 2.1%. <coughs> Coverage being the same. So from last year to this year, really no changes other than the building values. From a general liability standpoint, same thing. General liability, there no changes to the general liability coverage. Um, last year, um, as a result of some of the uh, uh, concerns over mine subsidence, the current program includes mine subsidence. However, it's a $50,000 deductible. So the state program uh, is available with a zero deductible. So last year we purchased the program through the DEP. Uh, the law enforcement liability for armed security, that was added. Um, and again, that remains the same. And with the PSPA, the um, excess liability umbrella policy covers over that. Within the law enforcement liability, there is a sublimit for expenses if there is an incident. So they do add an additional $250,000 for expenses if there was an incident. So that is included. The auto, basically same coverage as last year. The difference being two vehicles were deleted, four vehicles were added, and uh, the premium difference was 900 bucks. Now, the biggest issue from a pricing standpoint was the workers' comp. So the workers' comp was up 14.5%. Three main reasons. First, payrolls were up 2.5%. The rating factor that the school was um, measured on based on your claims, three-year running total, that went up 20%. Basically, because of one claim. So a good year fell off, a bad year came on. So about a 20% increase. The third thing, and I won't go into details, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled part of the workers' comp law unconstitutional. So as a result, the rating bureau added 6.06% to every business in the state of Pennsylvania. So because of that ruling, it's changing the, um, the way claims are handled in the workers' comp. So that's about a 28.6% increase. However, the overall increase was about 14% because of the UPMC rate. So again, coverage being the same, payroll being up, then the, the rate change factors. 
Now, this past year, uh, we delivered a check in May, a dividend check. Now, this was for the 2015 policy year. Highmark, which was bought out Brick Street. So during that time period, it was a good year. So they return a 21% dividend <laughs> for a $23,000 check. Now, that same company quoted this year, their premium was $127,000 versus the 97. So even with the dividend, they would not be competitive. And a dividend is not guaranteed. If you have a bad year, you get zero. So again, UPMC is still the, the most competitive that we shop. Richard, I, I, believe, I believe UPMC's premium, even with the rate increase, was still extremely competitive compared to Highmark's uh, proposed, proposal last year. Um, we had a significant decrease to go by going from Highmark to UPMC. But even with UPMC's going back up, they're still competitive where we did historically. Correct. Correct. Now, next year, assuming nothing happens between now and July 1st, a bad year is going to fall off. This current year is going to add on. So hopefully that, that rating factor will drop. may not drop exactly 20%, but it will come down. So again, it seems like history. Every other year there's one claim. That, and again, some of the claims you can't avoid. So that impacts the rating factor. The benefit that we had this year was UPMC offset the overall interest because their um, net rate was lower. Uh, the school leaders, errors, and emissions, uh, same pricing, same coverage, nothing different there. Um, the umbrella, it was down 3.1%, and again, that's just a rating factor, also based on overall claim history. Now, the main thing with the umbrella, it covers over the underlying liability, but uh, most importantly, it covers over the school leaders, errors, and emissions. And some of the umbrellas will not cover over that, but this program does. Student accident, uh, same coverage, same pricing. Travel and accident, same pricing, same coverage, no changes. Uh, public officials, same, um, and again, that's just a flat premium. Cyber, um, same pricing, same coverage. Uh, there was an issue um, that came up regarding ransomware. So most policies do not cover ransomware. Because if they did, insurance companies would be paying and companies wouldn't have to do anything to defend themselves. However, this program does cover the ransomware. They'll cover expenses as well to reboot the system and not pay the ransomware. But again, there was an incident where there was ransomware and the ransom was paid. Um, so again, that's the, uh, the cyber policy. So overall, Pricing last year, this year, 5.6%. However, the total increase was $14,065, $12,509 was the workers' comp. So basically everything is flat except for the workers' comp. And then next year, that rating factor should come down and drop that back down. Uh, any questions? And again, if anything, if anyone wants anything in more detail, I'm more than happy to meet with you and go over the uh, specifics um, in detail. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Moving on, um, we'll be asking the board to approve the adoption of the 2018-2019 final operating budget. There's an action. Um, we also will be asking for the adoption of the 2018-2019 village levy from Levy. There's an attachment there. Authorize the 2018 Homestead Farmstead Exclusion. Mr. Paul, would you want me to touch on the budget real quick? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Sure. I'll be very quick. I'll be very quick. But as uh, Mr. Palmer mentioned, we're going to be asking the board to approve the uh, final uh, budget, uh, which we'll actually be voting on it next month. Um, it has to be uh, adopted and submitted by June 30th. Nothing much has changed for our presentation in May, so this will be quick and painless, I promise you. Um, so our 
same proposed budget expenditure, which is still 56,066,709. We're looking at about a $630,000 increase, which is a 1.14% increase to our expenditures. Um, the major changes on the expenditure side still are wages. Uh, we had a $286,000 increase, which was about 1.21%. Remember, we had some retirements. We were able to uh, reduce a certain number of positions, which helped to control our wage increase. Uh, medical went down to 342000 which was roughly a 7% decrease. Again, mainly that's the result of our premiums uh, decreasing by 2.4% overall. Pizza's retirement is going up by 286, which is about 3.77% increase. Special education, we highlighted in the board retreat. We also spoke about the last board meeting. We had a pretty significant increase in our special education uh, um, costs, which we were able to narrow down to a select number of students um, that we you know, had not anticipated. So we've made that adjustment in the 2018-19 budget. Transportation, we had about a 3% increase in our transportation contract. In addition, we have about another 1% increase in there for some special education van transportation. Business operations, we saw a decrease of about 136, which is a little under 4% decrease, and that is mainly uh, the, the reduction in debt service um, that we've utilized our reserve accounts to cover some of our debt payments. Um, we always take a quick look back at our expenditure history with, with the removal of Peaser's retirement because I think that's pretty interesting to see how we've been successful in controlling expenditures that are we actually have control over. Um, as we know Peaser's is set at the state level and um, you know other than maybe controlling some salaries, the, the employer contribution rate is fixed um, outside of this board room. So, in 2009-10, it was 47196 less Beezer's retirement. The most recent audited financials show uh, actual expenditures of 48626 less Beezer's retirement. That's an increase of $1.4 million, or roughly 3% uh, total increase over the seven-year period. So on average, we're looking at an expenditure increase of around $204,000 uh, a year. That's the average increase for each of the last seven years. Now, I just want to focus in on a budget line of just for PEASERS, which we talked a little bit about in May. You can look at this. In 9-10, um, actual PEASERS retirement was uh, 1019511 or 2% of our operating costs. In 2016-17, they were slightly under $7 million, or roughly 13% of our operations. Um, it's increased a little under $6 million, or 585% increase over the last seven years. So obviously that has a significant impact on not just Greater Lake Church School District, but all schools across the state of Pennsylvania are, are uh, dealing with this. Summary for projected revenue changes. Uh, local, um, increase of about 428,000. State, we're looking at about an increase of about 62,000. Obviously the vast majority of that is retirement. We're looking at some reduction in some other areas such as the rental subsidy. Some of the uh, bonds that we received a higher rate of return on have fallen off, meaning they're paid off. And now we're picking up some like the athletic complex, which isn't a reimbursable project, so that impacts the amount of subsidy that we're eligible through the state. Um, but the 2016, 2017, 2018 borrowings for the new LES project are reimbursable. We received our plan on Part H, uh, noting that it was around 18.94%, so we'll start receiving subsidies for those. Projects. Uh, federal, based on current year, we're looking at a decrease of about $30,000. Uh, Mr. Prep, you're providing me with some updated figures today. Uh, I didn't want to flex those in there because we know the federal is really a moving target. It's one week it's up, the next week it's down. So it's, uh, we try to stay consistent with trend. That's what I try and do with federal. And then nothing on the other. So we're looking at a total increase in our revenues of $460,000. Uh, this report here, this was uh, provided at, at the May meeting, and I wanted to share this. Um, this is our performance audit. Uh, it's a state report that goes back and looks at many things within the school district from testing to its financials. But if you look at this financials, it takes a snapshot of the most five uh, recent periods that they had audits for. And this is going to tie a little bit into the fund balance discussion that I'm going to talk to. You can see in the 2000. 10-11 school year, which is the first one that's listed, we operated in a slight surplus. Same thing in the 2011-12 school year. 2012-13 is a slight um, deficit. And then the 2013-14 and 14-15, we operated in a surplus. 
So here are the amounts. In 1011, we operated a surplus of about $1 million, which meant we were about 1.07% within a balanced budget. Okay? And the reason I note this is a lot of times when we're putting these budgets together, people think that we have a $56 million budget. We actually have a $112 million budget because you've got to budget revenues and you've got to budget expenditures, and they're both very fluid. So if you underspend your expenditure, let's say by $200,000, but you get an extra half a million in revenue, you have a surplus of $700,000. It wasn't just because of this $56 million, it's a combination of the two. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of moving pieces to this. Um, in 11-12, we had a surplus of 405000 which was about 0.43% within a balanced budget. 12-13, a deficit of 91000 13-14, a surplus of 495. In 14-15, a surplus of 561. So we've had we had five years consecutive, four of the five years where we had a reasonable surplus, and even one year where we had a deficit. That's about as close to a balanced budget as you're going to see. So we had five five pretty good years, which led us to plan on using our fund balance and stuff in the past few years because that surplus trickles into your fund balance. Okay, so you can leave it in your unassigned fund balance, or you can designate it for capital projects, you know, we've done a little bit of both. We've done a little bit of a mixture. But if you look at the past two years, in 15, 16, now these are also audited numbers, but they weren't included in that state's performance audit because it's, it's, it was five years back. They'll be included in the next performance audit that comes out. So we operated at a deficit of 1.4 million. What I will tell you, in this school year, we took a million dollars to pay the upfront cost for LES because we had not received the first borrowing, the 2016 bond issuance. So we fronted the cash, knowing that in 2016-17, we'd get reimbursed. So in 2016-17, we got reimbursed a million dollars. So technically, if you're looking at these, if you just take that million dollars out of the equation, you operated at a deficit of about 469,000 in the 15-16 school year, and also a deficit in the 16-17 school year of about $400,000. All I did is took the 620, subtract the $1 million, bless you, that we got reimbursed in 16, 17. So those were two consecutive years that average out to be a deficit. So in our current year project, our projections, and again, if you go back to our June uh, 20, 2017 budget presentation, we included here what we're proposing to use of our existing fund balance to help the balance the budget. We anticipated using curriculum uh, or monies for curriculum purchases for language arts and math. About three hundred and fifty thousand dollars we were going to pull from from the uh, reserve. We've talked about we want that budget line to be level. That this year, the 1718, we actually had a spike. We were buying two curriculums that were a little bit more expensive. But rather than increase taxes or accommodate or adjust our budget for that, we said let's use our reserve because we know it's going to come back down. Okay, it's not going to be at that high level each year. So that was 350. That one we planned for. Special education, as we've talked about the last several meetings, we did not anticipate operating at a deficit of about a half million dollars, which we anticipate. In 16, 17, we were actually $600,000 over budget. We anticipate in 17, 18, we'll be about another half million dollars over budget. And then the debt service. We plan to use $385,000 of our fund balance to um, put towards debt service. So those three line items we're looking at in our expenditure, possibly look, dipping into our, our fund balance about $1.2 million. So let's talk about 18, 19. What we've been talking about, what I've shared with the finance committee, what I would recommend is that we use $12,000 of our fund balance for athletic capital purchases, such as a seven-man sled, field hockey goals, and a wrestling mat, that we use $43,833 towards special education agreements and settlements that we've entered into. Then we use $33,000 for additional curriculum capital purchases such as the tech ed, drill press, and music. We have instruments, the drum line, the piano repairs, language arts, seventh and eighth grade interactive readers. And then finally, debt service. This would be the third and final year that we will plan to use our reserve to put towards our debt service because our debt service is going to drop off in 1920. We know it's coming. So we just, we're trying to bridge the gap to get there. So we anticipate using about $600,000 of our reserve, unassigned fund balance, uh, to back, uh, for the 18-19 school year. So at this time, our recommendation is to approve a final budget of $56 million. Millage impact would be 
0.5 mils, so we go from 80.75 to 81.25. The impact on the average homeowner would be $13 per year. Um, I noted this last year, I thought I would update it, but I think it's good information. In 1920, or I'm sorry, 2019-2010, the highest millage rate in the county was 82.88. The low is 63.95. The average was 72.95. Greater late year about a millage rate of 69. In 17-18, the high is 93.62. The low is 74.61. The average is 84.29. We are 8.75, and we have the fifth lowest millage rate in West Warren County. So I think we've done a lot here educationally, we've done a lot with our facilities, and I think we've done a good job of help trying to keep the millage rate um, as low as we, as low as, as low as can, can be done. Are there any questions on the um, budget? Again, that's all I have. And Mr. Palmer, if you want me to summarize a couple of these other ones real quick and get them out of the way. Yeah, so the next motion after that would be um, the village levy, which again talks for 81.25. Then we have the homestead farmstead exclusion. Um, the allocation for that was $755,000 uh, in gaming money. Um, that would equate to $90.50. $92.22. Each property owner will receive $92.22, which is pretty, pretty consistent with what you received historically. So when you get your tax bill, you should see the assessed value of your home minus $1,135. Your assessed value is reduced by that $1,135. It equates to a savings of $92.22. So we'll need to improve that. The reenactment of Act 511 taxes, the Act 511 taxes are real estate transfer tax, which is 0.5% the earned income tax, the per capita tax 511, which is $5 for anybody over the age of 21, and the local service tax, which is $5 also. We'll be asking for approval of the reenactment of per capita 679, and that is anybody who's over the age of 18 that has an income of $5,000 or more will pay a Five dollar fee. Again, these are reoccurring. This, there's nothing new to these. Um, we would also uh, ask the board to approve the extension of the Section 125 uh, cash benefit plan, which basically anybody who has waived medical coverage would be receive 50 percent of premium savings, up to a maximum of 4,300 dollars uh, for waiving coverage. Um, we would also ask the board to approve continuing in the 2019 real estate tax assessment appeals program. We've been participating in that since 2016. Uh, it generates roughly $74,000 annually um, in additional uh, tax income. And then the gifts, grants, and donations, we received two. One was anonymous, and it was $100 to put towards the food service donations for stu student delinquent accounts. And then we also received uh, a portion of our STEC grant that went to find the 2017-18 mentor coordinator position. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Yeah, thank you. Our next finance committee meeting will be Wednesday, August the 14th, 2018, 5 p.m. here at uh, the Senior High School Library platform. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Vice President.
uh, student activities and recreation, we have one report on that now. Um, and uh, community relations, I'll try to turn it for Dr. Torture. The 2018-19 free and reduced milk policy will be on the agenda. The National School Breakfast Program will be on the agenda. And the National School Lunch Program will also be on the agenda. And the paper and the OSD Park and Recreation Commission meeting will be March 15th.
Um, in addition, our board meetings, um, our, our regular meeting is next Tuesday. And please note that at this point there are no board meetings to be held in July of 18. I would like to just take a note to thank all of our community partners who donated dollars and gifts uh, to the Ottawa Park event yesterday. Several people were there. Um, we also just want to um, say a public thank you to Mrs. Allshouse for doing such a wonderful job collecting the dollars as well as putting together all of those prizes. I know there were numerous, numerous families in the community who took home some very nice gifts. Um, so it's a very nice event to end our school year, and we are now in the process of getting ready to open in August. So thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for putting out the We did a lot of these He's coming back. So thank you for coming to me. I want to say that we did. I need to get the flag.